Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the Art, Peace, and Security elective. I'm pleased to welcome our next moderator, Dr. Mary Rahm. Dr. Mary Rahm is a professor in the National Security Affairs and uh, at, the, at the Naval War College. She also teams up the History of Women in War and Combat elective. She founded the WPS chair at the Naval War College and serves in this capacity from 2009 to 2016. Please welcome Dr. Rahm. So I see I, we have some guests. The provost is here. Um, Chief of Staff, correct? President, sir, president of the War College. I've never met you, actually. <laughs> I've never met you. And we have the dean of um, <clears throat> electives over here. So welcome, all of you. Welcome, students. Um, and Seminar 14, little shout out to you folks. I see a few of you are here. Um, so today, this is a really unique panel, I think, for WPS. And I became interested in this um, after studying art history for the past pretty much in my lifetime, but formalized that with a, di a diploma finally at um, Cambridge University in the UK. So we have three very um, interesting panelists here today. And I also wanna thank Dr. Yamin uh, for supporting this elective uh, because I went to her with the idea and I was really pleased that um, it was accepted. So the panel's entitled Art, Peace and Security. I think you will find the three panelists' presentations to be highly illustrating and illuminating about the realm of art and its visibility in the women, peace, and security agenda. We'll begin down on the far end with Ms. Amy Herman. She's the author of several titles, including Use Your Eyes to Boost Your Brain, Visual Intelligence, and Fixed, How to Perfect the Fine Art of Problem Solving. She'll present on artificial intelligence through the art of perception, followed by her, will be the panel on the power and impact of storytelling presented by Ms. Beth Murphy, who is the director and producer of Ground Truth Films and an award-winning journalist and filmmaker. And then finally, we have Ms. Kathleen Pearl from the Military Women's Memorial, the only national memorial documenting all U.S. military women's service, and she will talk about the power of museums. Uh, you may each um, review the panelists' biographies in detail in the online program, so I encourage you to do that. And after all three presentations, there will be a question and answer session. So Amy, I'm gonna begin with you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ram. Thank you, President, the Provost, and distinguished guests and students, thank you very much for having me. I just want to correct one thing in the program. I will not be speaking exclusively on artificial intelligence. Uh, I am, the title of my presentation is The Art of Perception, See What Matters. And uh, again, I'll be happy to take questions about artificial intelligence and works of art, but it is not my area of expertise. When I was thinking about the first image that I wanted to show you today, to begin to capture your imagination, to think about how we can use works of art to improve observation, perception, and communication, I chose this work by the South African artist Philip Barlow. If you're tempted, if you wear glasses like I do, and you're tempted to take them off and rub your eyes to try to bring this into focus, you're gonna rub your eyes all day. It's never gonna come into focus. It is, in fact, a painting and I believe that Philip Barlow's work is a compelling reminder to all of us that we need to get better at shifting our perspective and shifting our perception. We're living and working in a complex world where nothing is obvious and even less is clear. Those two words are not allowed in my training. So I wanted to give you an overview of the art of perception this morning. My work is inspired by the Iranian film director and photographer Abbas Kirishtami. You're looking at Kirishtami's work now. From 1996 to 2012, Kirishtami created this project called Regardez Moi, Look at Me. He ran around the Louvre and he took pictures of people looking at art. And you can see the images are very complex. They have a subject, they have a work of art. And I like to think that my work in the art of perception has taken Kirishtami's work to the next level. I work with leaders around the globe in the intelligence community, in military, in law enforcement, in science, medicine, critical response, 
to use works of art to help with the analysis, perception, observation, and since uh, COVID, the idea of problem solving. How can we use the act of looking at works of art to articulate what we see and what we perceive to come up with more sustainable, innovative, and, uh, and more creative solutions? Why art? You're looking at a photograph from April 23rd, 2023. It was on the front page of the New York Times. It was top of the fold, full color. I remember opening the door to my apartment because I get the paper the old fashioned way on the weekends. And I opened the door and I saw this photograph on the front page of the New York Times and I couldn't stop looking at it. The caption read, Nadia Mefodivna, 70 cooking in her basement in Seversk, a town in eastern Ukraine, while the bombs were going, on, going off around her. All my colleagues in art history were texting me saying, did you see the photograph this morning? Did you see the photograph? But it was one friend who really nailed it. He said, it is Vermeer without the window. So I went to my archive and I found this. I found Vermeer's painting from 1655 on the right and the photograph from the New York Times on the left, there is not a minute between them. I believe that art is the greatest chronicler of our time. It gives us a way to explain the inexplicable and an anchor in very turbulent times. It is a way to renew the idea of, of human, humanity's capacity for creativity and coming up with new solutions. In the short time that I have with you, I wanted to give you an overview of what it is that I do with all the stakeholders and participants in my program. So I want you to look at this slide. This is a barn in Kinday, Michigan, and I'd like you to analogize it to the work that you do. Whatever field or discipline you are in, I want you to think of your work as this barn. The owner of the barn in Kinday was concerned about its future. She was worried about the effects of extreme climate worried about abandonment, possible neglect. So she retained the architectural firm of Katie Newell and her team to come in and help strengthen the barn. Katie Newell and her team came in. They ran around the interior of the barn to determine the sources of strength and weakness. And then what I love about the project is they gave it the name, The Secret Sky. And instead of adding to the barn to make it stronger, they actually removed a section of the barn, an acute angle from foundation to roof to let the light in and anchor the barn more firmly to the ground. And most importantly, they strengthened the barn from the interior. They didn't add to it. And this was the stunning result. You can see that the barn is anchored to the landscape, the light comes in, and most importantly, the barn is strengthened from within because when I am training all the different groups that I do, they don't need anything to add to their plates. I want to give them tools that can be used inherently, that they can think about it when they're on the ground or in the air or on the water, or most importantly, in exigent circumstances. But I asked you to analogize your work to this barn no one's work is single faceted like the east to west orientation of this barn. But the architects thought of this too. They thought about the barn at sunrise and sunset and in clement weather, what kind of shadows it might, they, the barn would create. And most ingeniously, they filled the barn with solar powered lights so at night it could illuminate the infrastructure and people could see the barn in a way they never could before. But most importantly, in the fields of intelligence and in the military, we can't only think about what we have to say and what we know about our own strengths and weaknesses, alliances and hostilities. We have to worry about how they're being perceived by others, by hostile nations, by allies. So the architects were aware of this as well. And they knew that the barn would become a destination. So they wanted to make sure that visitors to the barn would understand the significance of the transformation. So they made sure that they would be able to explain the transformation of the barn. What it is that I try to do is just this. I want to help all my stakeholders to strengthen from within and anchor them more firmly to the landscape by thinking about how they can augment their observation, their perception, and their communication skills. 
So I'm going to give you an example of one of the exercises that I do, and I'm going to ask you now to introduce yourself to the person next to you or behind you because you need a partner. You can either be two or three. Can you find your partner right now, please? All right, everyone has a partner. So this is what we're going to do. I'm gonna give you 45 seconds. One person in the partnership or one person in the trio is going to keep his or her eyes open and your partners are gonna close their eyes for 45 seconds. The person whose eyes are open is going to describe the image that I put on the screen and when I call time, don't say another word. Listeners will open their eyes and I'll direct questions to the audience. Decide who's going to keep their eyes open and who's going to close them. If you're a trio, one open, two closed. All right, everyone have a partner? Okay, I'll repeat the instructions. When I tell you to close your eyes, Listeners will close their eyes. Describers will have 45 seconds to describe the work of art that I put up on the screen. When I call time, open your eyes. Don't say another word. Half the auditorium, close your eyes, please. Describers, you'll have 45 seconds to describe the following image. Ready, go. Open your eyes, don't say another word. Open your eyes and look at the screen, please. One of these three images was being described to you. And I'd like you to raise your hand when I point to the one that you believe was being described to you. There's no kicking, pinching, hitting, laughing, or coughing describers when I point to the correct one. All right, raise your hand if you think it was the bottom picture that was being described to you, bottom picture. All right, hands down. Who believes it was the upper left picture that was being described to you? Good, hands down. And who believes it was the upper right picture? And it was the upper right picture. Now, <laughs> here's what I want to know. <clears throat> this is where I take the opportunity and I usually walk around the room and I ask those who got the correct answer to tell me what it was from their partner that made them pick the right one. And I've heard all sorts of answers. I've heard, well, a dark bridge, or autumnal colors, or red, or there's more of a reflection in the front. Those are all good answers, but none is dispositive. And let me show you why. By the way, did anyone use the word Monet in describing the painting? Well, good for you, but they were all by Monet, so that's not gonna help you. <laughs> but yay for art history. So I asked you to describe the image to your partner. Now, here's a situation where someone is depending on you. So why do I ask you to do this? How many times does someone say to you, what are my takeaways? What is the gist of the meaning? What do I need to go in? And you need to distill the information down. So each of you had to distill this information down and there were all kinds of things. But if any of you had looked at the big picture and noticed that there's this weird white border on the right side and the bottom of the slide and you told your partner, you win the game. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's just stupid. You're thinking, you gave me this complex image with foliage and reflection and water and light and a bridge. Why would I concentrate on a dumb white border on the right side and the bottom? Because it's the game changer. It is the one aspect, if you saw and described to your partner, 
they have no choice but to pick the correct image. I will tell you this, I have been using this exercise since 2004. In the 20 years that I've been doing the exercise, 15 pairs of people have indicated to me that they included the white border in their description. Nine of the 15 have been special operations forces. And when I ask them why they included the white border, their answer is always the same. We are trained to use every piece of information we have. So are you. Big picture, small details are equally important. It is one of the biggest takeaways from my training. We need to look at the big picture and the small details. So in my last slide, that is how I can be reached, the books I've written, where I am on social media, but more importantly, I wanted to give you a visual illustration of looking at your work and your world before and after the art of perception. I've chosen two portraits by the artist Chuck Close. He's a 20th and 21st century portrait painter, paralyzed from the shoulders down. He had minimal use of his fingers and he painted with a brush in his mouth. He died during COVID. But the self-portrait that you see on the left, Chuck's portrait from 2005, is how I envision my clients and stakeholders see their work in their world before the art of perception. There's nothing wrong with seeing the world that way. A bald white man with green eyes, round glasses, a goatee, and a t-shirt looking right at you. But my hope is that after taking the training with me, they'll see their world more like Chuck's portrait done six years later. He broke down every quadrant of information. He made it more colorful, more complex, more compelling. He lowered his glasses to not miss the big picture or the small details. And I believe if my participants incorporate the concepts that we talk about in the art of perception, it helps them to be sharper and keener professionals and more effective leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. And I've been taking a few notes, so we're going to move away from um, art as the great chronicler of our time, shadows, awareness, and transformation and perception. And next we have Kathleen Pearl. And Kathleen, look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, President Provost, Dr. Rahm, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Beth Murphy, and today I want to share with you why I believe that storytelling is uniquely positioned to foster positive social change and provide hope for a better future. And I'll be using case studies of stories and impact campaigns that over the years have meant the most to me. And I also want to talk with you about why I am working to make my newest documentary film the first documentary to use AI fully to anonymize the film. Uh, it will make it impossible to identify the people and the places in order to protect the brave women and girls in Afghanistan who were brave enough to share their stories with me. Oops. There are so many powerful attributes that are inherent to storytelling that you will see at work in these case studies, including the humanization of issues, emotional engagement, documenting marginalized voices, and offering hope and resilience among them. For the feature documentary, What Tomorrow Brings, we embedded with the first all-girls school in a small Afghan village right on the outskirts of Kabul province. It's called the Zabuli Education Center. And I should share that I now sit on the board of the organization that runs the school, and it was just an enormous honor to be embedded at this school over the course of eight years. Uh, it started as a K-4 school, and then every year there was a grade added, and I started filming when the school started, and I didn't finish until there was the first graduate, the high school graduating class. By sharing the stories of the women and girls in this small village, I believe that we really have the ability to transform very distant and very complex problems into relatable narratives. And in this film and in many other projects that came about as a result of it, there was a New York Times op doc that, that I did, um, as well as a podcast episode, a multi, uh, multimedia series. It told the story of students, teachers, the village elders, the parents, um, for a, a real intimate look um, that revealed the broader struggle 
for education and ultimately human rights for women and girls in Afghanistan. As the impact campaign for the project, I wanted to listen to the girls themselves. There were a lot of directions the impact campaign could have taken, but what did the girls want? What did the girls need? You know, here they were graduating from high school and all of them said the same thing. They wanted to go to college, but there were so many barriers to going to college. They didn't have the money, they didn't have the transportation, they didn't have the approval from their dads to leave the village. And so we met with the village elders and we asked them like, hey, uh, what would you think if we opened a women's college right here in the village, in your backyard, right next to the K to 12 school? And now keep in mind, these guys, up until the day before the K to 12 school opened, they were coming to the founder, Razia Jean, to say, uh, you know, Razia, we really think that this should be a boys school. What do you think? You have, you know, 12 more hours, let's, just, let's turn this around. So they did not want the girls' school to come to town. Now here we were on their doorstep asking, can we build a women's college? And they said yes. So I started a crowdfunding campaign and within about six weeks, uh, raised $130,000. And six weeks after that, Arazi and I were back in Afghanistan for the groundbreaking. You can see some pictures here of the very first graduates of the college. Um, importantly, we decided to make this a college where the girls would learn to be midwives, which was really critical. Um, so he, really here you're looking at the first female healthcare workers in that village. Uh, Afghanistan has one of the highest infant and uh, maternal mortality rates in the world. So they were really serving an incredible need. For impact work, Outside of Afghanistan, uh, we partnered with NGOs who are working on the ground in six countries, including Bangladesh, and the campaign was part of a part of a campaign to lower child marriage rates in these communities, uh, very rural communities in these countries. And I'm very proud to say that uh, the campaign succeeded in lowering child marriage in one village in Bangladesh by 60%. Where women and girls are educated and empowered, societies tend to be more prosperous and more stable. Families and communities fare better economically, and there is a strong correlation between girls' education and peace. In this news report that we did for uh, PBS NewsHour, we continued our commitment to reporting on girls' education. And then in this report specifically showed a direct connection between girls' education climate crisis resilience, and a rejection of extremism. What happened was this, these young women who were educated were now getting jobs, and there were women who were now working as teachers at, a, at the school, and their fathers were all farmers, and the climate crisis hits, there's an incredible drought. Um, the, they rely on snowfall for you know, to be in the mountains, it melts and it comes down and then it waters their crops in the spring and there hadn't been a snowflake for three years. And so the farmers were not bringing in any income, but guess what, their daughters were because they had an education and now they had a job. Had the paychecks not been coming in from the daughters, the fathers told us that they were prepared to switch over their crops to grow opium, strongly linked to terrorism, um, because it's more drought resistant, but because they had the daughter's salaries coming in, they did not have to do that. The second, the second case study I want to share with you is from the Iraq War. Um, at the heart of this story is a modern day Oscar Schindler named Kirk Johnson and the hundreds of US affiliated Iraqis that he made a list of and tried to save. Um, it's called the list and here you can see some of the, the harrowing details of that list. You know, Yagdan, US aid manager was threatened. Faisal, US Army interpreter kidnapped. Haider, US Army force, US Air Force interpreter was injured. Nabil, US government translator injured. Sawain, US government translator killed. Dina, US USA ID contractor poisoned kidnapped. This list goes on and on and on. 
Uh, this documentary was filmed over the course of four years in Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and the United States, and I'd like to share the trailer with you. I'm tired of hiding, I'm tired of running away. This shouldn't have happened to me or to the majority of Iraqi people running away from their country. There was an implicit bargain. You come to work with us, we'll take care of you. You run these risks for us, we'll watch out for you. We were very proud. We were showing up our badges. Look, we are working with Americans. It's very good work. They are very nice people. These are Iraqis who sat with Americans and helped us try to rebuild Iraq. I was told that your future will be safe with us, we will be protected, and we discovered that actually that wasn't the whole truth. These Iraqis are not dying for Iraq. They're dying because they're coming to work for our country. They're dying for America. Day after day, we started to hear about people being slaughtered and being abducted for working for the U.S. government. A young American named Kirk Johnson, who served in USAID in Fallujah, has taken it upon himself to find every Iraqi who has worked for USAID. There's a thousand names sitting in front of you right now. And of the thousand names, only 40 have been processed. Could you explain that? How many more Iraqis are going to have to die until they respond to this? In the first days, we didn't feel that this list was leading anywhere. But this list is actually something, and more people are taking it seriously. Great to see you, too. I've been doing this for a year, and we've gotten around 30 people in. Tens of thousands need the same help. My concern is if the American troops go out this country, what will happen for somebody like me? You know, something I remember that I really like it's a quote for Mother Teresa. You know what she said? She said, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Our impact campaign for this film project focused on reaching lawmakers who had the power to extend and expand the special immigrant visa program that was designed to let in endangered Iraqis. Uh, the visa program at that time was set to expire uh, before even filling about 20% of the slots that were available. So we partnered with the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, the US Helsinki Commission, to hold screenings for lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And we did additional reporting to highlight the fact that America's Afghan allies were facing the same perils. This was part of a much larger effort and um, I'm, you know, at the time, it was amazing that the uh, the visa program was was extended because of that uh, because of that concerted effort from a lot of people, which included the film. This storytelling effort really held people in power accountable, and it lent itself to a really important conversation and analysis, which is when the U.S. stands up for its allies especially those who are in vulnerable positions like translators and local support, local support personnel during military operations, it can strengthen global peace and security. And of course, the reverse is true, which is when we abandon our allies, we deplete global peace and security. By focusing on solutions to seemingly intractable problems and focusing on the work of people who are trying to solve those problems, it really is my desire to offer a glimmer of hope in the world and to show that when hope and agency and dignity combine, it's just an extraordinarily powerfully positive force that reminds us that yes, the future really can be better than the past and that we all have a role in making it that way. And that message is uh, really at the heart of Afghan dreamers. And uh, this is a film that's out now on Paramount Plus, um, produced with MTV Films. And I'd like to share this trailer with you as well. Also, what I'm going to do. 
حتما باید اگه محرم خود ما میبود میرفتیم با پس میامونه و در کل همه مردم آفغانستان هست باز هم اگر برای تک تک دختران و یعنی تمام بچه های افغانستان فرصت داده بشه اونها میتونن به صداد های خور در سطح جهانی میتونید استفاده کنیم درس بخونیم شما خود خود به یک جای برسونیم بعضی ها مخالف بودن بعضی از دوستان و چاید بعضی از استعداد و توانایی بیشتری در ارسه دارن و برای یک دختر مثلا عادی به نظر نمیرسه که در آن یک سد و چهل تن جان باختن و بیش از چهار ست تن دیگر هم زخمی شده همون امنیت مثلا تیم ما به خاطر از اینکه ما به تشویش هستم به خاطر از اینکه مثلا چون میفهمین که خیلی نگاهانه وقت صبح میشه که Politics divides the world Technology unite the world که تا دیروز در آن ده ها تن درس می‌خواندند اکنون ویرانه ای بر جامانده است حمله کننده این تاریخ که اکنون گمان می رود از خطرات آب آگاه هستیم بله و ما می دانیم که کنسه های زیادی در کمین ما هستند از توی موریت های اماق اقیانوس هستیم و می خواهیم با شنا در زیر آب آن ما را به دست بیاوریم دخل تیم هستن و اونم نمیتوره می کنم و با سوره به جایی دیگه هستن یعنی استاب نمی کنم همیشه در حال تقنی دادن و دیگه هستن When the Taliban came to power in uh, 2021, the several girls had already left uh, from the robotics team had already left the country, and I helped to lead efforts to evacuate the remaining girls and all of their family members. Um, they're all now in the United States, and you can see them here. Um, very proud to have gotten them college scholarships here, and they are moving into their dorm right here. Um, had they still been in the country, we would not have been able to release the film in the same way, and that's why I do believe the future of AI has an important role to play in protecting subjects. And my newest film uh, focuses again on girls' education, filmed with girls who are now unable to go to school because of the Taliban ban on girls' education past grade six. And by using AI, my hope is that you know, we'll be able to release the new film without the girls having a fear of retribution to address you know, journalistic integrity in this case and broader ethical standards of journalism and documentary filmmaking, I believe just the key is transparency, uh, to communicate well with audiences about the fact that AI is being used and why it's so important that it is used, especially for social impact storytelling. Um, it's the kind of storytelling that I think maybe should come with a uh, warning, and I really am appreciative for this opportunity to spend this time with you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Very, very interesting, Beth. Um, let's move on to um, our next panelist, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to the War College leadership, and um, I don't know if Dr. Yamin's here. Um, this is the first time I've actually attended the conference, but I have used this conference every year. Um, for my own professional development, as everyone does, I think the War College really leads in this space. And so to be here, especially with um, everyone that's participated, I've learned so much. And um, I was already familiar with your work before we met today. Um, but I think what you'll see is that there are a lot of similarities, right, in storytelling and what we hope to achieve um, by being good storytellers. Um, and it's mutually reinforcing, right? So everything that we do um, strengthens each other's work. Um, so again, I'm just grateful, grateful for what you do and, and grateful to be here. And I'm always excited to come and talk about my favorite subjects, museums, WPS, and how they intersect. And I think there really is truth in saying that if you want to find out what's going on nearly everywhere in the world, you need to go find the women, and you should keep an eye on and go find the artists. And that will tell you a lot about what is really going on in the ground truth there. My case study today highlights the Afghan women who served in the female tactical platoon, or called the FTP for short. 
And you can see in the photo behind me, and you'll see additional photos throughout my presentation, of these remarkable women, and the photos were taken circa 2016 in Afghanistan. It's a strong visual reminder to help us reflect on their courage, and not only how hard they fight, but how hard they continue to fight for freedom. And for those who may be unfamiliar with the FTP, they are the largest contingent of foreign-born born women to have fought and served alongside US Armed Forces. They were recruited and trained by the US to serve as a part of the Afghan Special Forces. The FTP participated in direct action combat missions against the Taliban, often alongside US Special Forces. It's approximated the FTP carried out nearly 2,000 missions between 2011 until the fall of Kabul to the Taliban in 2021. But before we talk about preserving and sharing the FTP stories at the Military Women's Memorial, I do want to back up a little bit to provide greater context about museums, including women's and gendered museums, and the role they play in upholding human rights and democratic values. This is particularly relevant today as we see global trends toward democratic backsliding, and yes, that includes in the United States, a rise in populist rule, and ongoing authoritarian threats. Now more than ever, in this environment, museums can offer hope, resistance, and democratic resilience. I don't think I have the clicker. <laughs> oh, don't get up. Get up. All right, dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> Whose story is told and who tells it matters. The stories and narratives presented in museums reveal what and who is revered and important to a society. Museums have always been arbiters of power and culture. However, those power dynamics have shifted in recent decades, and we will get to that in the next few slides. But first, I want to think about this and couch it in gendered terms. And, and look at the long and persistent history of silencing women. And silencing isn't just the suppression of voices, it's the erasure of women's agency and self-determination. It strikes at the center of their human rights and leaves us all at a deficit in our ability to truly understand and empathize with one another, which is core to building trust. There's a wide range of research and studies detailing how silencing occurs at the individual, institutional, and cultural domains. And we've talked a lot about that yesterday with the presenters and today as well. But just to give you sort of an idea for the wide um, range of how the silences occur, um, enforcement of family hierarchies, male-dominated media, restrictive access to and limited representation in education, healthcare, and a fair judicial process. And on the daily, ridicule, harassment, and abuse in real life and online, which is particularly brutal, has a deep impact on a woman's ability and her decision to either speak up and engage or not. At a recent Atlanta Council event, Moira Whelan, who's the Director for Democracy and Technology at the National Democratic Institute, remarked that while she's been working around the globe um, and working with people regarding democratic principles, the number one reason women on a local level do not want to participate is because of the threats of abuse and violence both in person and online. It's definitely a deterrent because it affects not only them but their families, their ability to make an income, it damages their reputation and credibility, and to quote, how hard they have to work just to have a voice. So now we can take a look at some of the con converging factors that are at play here in terms of trends in museum practices and how that interplays with security frameworks. And while museums play a significant role in shaping our understanding of culture, history, and identity, they are also symbols of and rooted in a colonial history and Western imperial expansion. Historically, museums built and maintained their collections through a very unbalanced power dynamics. However, in the past 50 years, Amid civil and indigenous rights and women's rights movements, museums began to be held to task for their collections and how they are displayed and interpreted. And it brought museums to realize that they can no longer thrive outside of and above the social context in which they exist. So if you think of this in easy terms, I'll do a Museum 101. In shorthand in the museum community, they think of it as going from the temple of all-knowing knowledge to a forum. 
And I've listed just sort of some outdated practices and all the best practices that are used today. But you can think of, you know, in terms, the focus used to be on collections, on those artifacts. And while that is important to preserve, um, what you would typically get from that is a very singular narrative of history. And in shorthand, it was kind of this great grand narrative, very linear, typically really great white men of a certain privilege and background doing single-handedly really great things, right? And we know that's not the full picture of history or where we are today, but you would think so had you gone to visit those more traditional museums. Now the focus is on, it's more human focused, it's community focused um, and focused on your audience. Um, and they view history, they ask new questions about history from multiple perspectives and they really encourage critical inquiry and it is definitely a place to inspire civic engagement. And something that is very important to museums is trust and you touched on it too, um, the ethics involved. Uh, museums, time and again, there are professional organizations, the American Alliance of Museums and the International Council of Museums. And time and again, year after year, um, the public says that they trust museums. Uh, they trust it more than media, they trust it more than entertainment. The only thing they trust more than museums on the survey are their close friends and family. So these institutions are very important. They provide guidance and oversight for museums around the world on best practices and everything from governance to security. These professional standards help the museum community maintain their credibility and trustworthiness. And so today's museums really are, think of them, they're rooted in public service and guided by legal and ethical frameworks. This reaffirms what it means to live in an open and free society by encouraging inquiry, critical thinking, debate, exploration, and challenging the status quo. Museums are also uniquely positioned as public educators who engage all ages and all learning styles. And you know, similar to libraries, right? They're really centers of lifelong learning, informal learning, aside from the formal education in schools. They offer a low threat environment, if you will, in places where people can experience something unfamiliar or even provocative in an informed and thoughtful way. Museums can help us see things in a new perspective, including how we see ourselves and each other. Simply put, at their best, museum, their power now lies in their ability to build empathy, build community, and promote discourse. They reflect the, the communities they serve. And in keeping with the theme of this year's conference and the soft power, hard power, um, I always think of it, you know, typically when you mention museums and a security, uh, people think of public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy. Um, but I think it's interesting that you think of them only in a soft power realm when they are very clearly hard power targets. And I think that speaks to how powerful they truly are. And you need to look no further than what Russia's doing in Ukraine. They very, it's not collateral damage, they very purposefully have targeted museums and cultural sites, not only looted them, but destroyed. Um, and I think, this is a little bit dated, so I'm sure it's gone up from here, but from UNESCO, almost 1,600 cases of damage to Ukrainian cultural heritage sites have been documented, including 700 monuments and memorials, and more than 200 museums, archives, and libraries. And again, that's not accidental. Russia has in no small degree justified their war on Ukraine on the basis of history and culture. So I also do wanna raise the issue, not of smart power, but of sharp power. And there are uh, uh, many different organizations um, that are framing this. And one of them is the National Endowment for Democracy, but they describe it, right? Like soft power is all about attraction and persuasion. Got it, but sharp power looks at these cultural institutions and how they're being weaponized. Um, as a part of misinformation and disinformation campaigns, false and misleading information to shape the public opinion in their favor. While at the same time, they're protecting their own populations from any dissent or outside influence of any kind of alternative narrative. And sharp power also involves manipulating narratives to downplay or obscure human rights abuses and atrocities. And just for an example, uh, late last year, early this year, there was a Russian organized association that was set to host an exhibition in Italy, and it was titled The Rebirth of Mariupol. And they characterized what the Red Cross called, you know, an apocalyptic uh, human disaster. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, the city was razed. 
This exhibit the Russians wanted to put on um, couched this and characterized it as the symbolic of the city of the popular uprising against Kyiv, now facing rapid reconstruction process under the auspices of the Russian Federation, of which it has become an integral part. Ultimately, Italian officials revoked the permission to display the exhibit, citing that they firmly support the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine to which the Russian organizers of the project responded via a press release publicly that the decision was an attack on their free expression. And the final framework, of course, is WPS, and I think I'm gonna, for time's sake, kind of, uh, since we've been going over all that, I won't go over it again in the tenets of how the gendered lens matters. Which brings us to um, another interesting trend in museums. So while the traditional museums are holding up a more critical lens to themselves, there was also an emergence really interesting of grassroots community museums, including women and gender museums around the world. And this map um, is an indication of nearly 96, it's probably a little over 100 by now, of these or at women's museums. The first museums were really established in the 1950s in terms of women museums with the U.S. Army Women's Museum in 1955. But the 70s and 80s saw the establishment of nearly two-thirds of the museums represented on this map, which was presented by the International Association of Women's Museums. Some are brick and mortar, so they have physical locations of where you can go visit. Others exist only in the virtual space. And others have special programs like traveling exhibitions, oral history projects, and other creative means. Each has its own unique circumstances, mission, collections, and approach, yet there are a few commonalities that they largely share. One is that they self-organized, which is impressive, to empower those being marginalized while also reimagining, restructuring, and re-engineering the very structures that marginalize them in the first place. And they are not focused on one great person or one great anything. They really are focused on listening to and capturing and sharing multiple and all voices. And to be heard and valued really is a very human need. And this is interesting as well. And the third point really goes back to the silencing of women. Um, and just thinking about how all of these museums are working to end epistemic oppression and injustice, and epistemic just being a fancy word for knowledge. But we see it across the board, around the globe, that women have been silenced and marginalized in terms of being known for holding knowledge and being speakers and givers of knowledge. So all of these mu museums seek to correct that systematic dismission of the knowledges of women. And just one example of one of the, the museums I think is interesting. In 2007, Iranian Nobel Peace Prize laureate Shireen Abadi, um, she started along with one of her colleagues a museum in Iran, but shortly before it was set to open, agents confiscated all of the content and she went to prison. And now that, but the project lives on outside of Iran. They have a touring exhibit and it's called With Evan From Love and it's um, artworks made by women that have been imprisoned. All right, I'm getting short on time, but the Military Women's Memorial, so getting down into the case study. Uh, we are a 501c3. We are dedicated to preserving and sharing the stories of the nearly three million women that have served the United States in or with the United States military from the Revolutionary War until today. We have a host of different ways that we do this for outreach. We have a collection of more than 8,000 items. It's the only the largest location of primary objects related to women's service in the world, 1,400 oral histories. We do have exhibitions, permanent, temporary, and traveling. And if I can make a shameless plug here, we do have an exhibit we're launching this year that's gonna focus on women in the United States Navy on combatant ships in August. The CNO will be there. So consider yourselves invited. More information on that. We also have a traveling exhibition called The Color of Freedom, which focuses on women of color that have served the nation. So I think, again, in the interest of time, um, why this is important is because not only for military women, but all women, uh, when you're looking, it's not that they weren't there, but they just always, the documentation and how you would do historical research, you have to do it differently when you're looking for people who largely were in, technically invisible, right? So depending on if you're looking at the census or different documentation, you have to research women differently. 
Um, and in some cases, the only thing you have is um, oral histories. There may not be a written record or anything, but you have to go with the oral histories. Did that flip? Okay, so our case study for the female tactical platoons. So after 2021, um, it was not easy, but I think all of them made it out of Afghanistan and have resettled here. And what I heard time and time again is they felt erased. They left with nothing, they had to leave with nothing. Um, and they came largely without their families. Um, and so the work of a museum really is to give them their own agency and their own voice back. So we've worked very hard, it's an ongoing project, to capture their oral histories. That way they, they can say from their perspective what their experience is like and how they feel about it. So you get that really nuanced. Um, and I think it is also important to share that other organizations like the Library of Congress, who has a wonderful veterans history project, oral history program, their definition is too narrow. They don't, the, these women fall through the cracks everywhere and so their stories weren't being captured. And the rest of the slides really I've pulled out just as a, in examples of quotes. And um, again, to, the not, to not be erased, right? Um, and even within the Army who oversaw the program, um, it was a fight to keep the program and they didn't keep good records or documentation on the program. So if you went to them and asked how many women served in the FTP or the culture support teams, they would have a very hard time giving you an accurate answer. Um, Manaz Akbari in the United States lives in the DC area. Um, she was the commander of the female tactical platoon. But again, these women um, all faced significant challenges and threats. And I think the point also to make is women are not a monolith, right? Even within the FTPs of about 40 that were working on capturing their stories, there are vastly different experiences from their family experiences and how they got to serve and where they are now. And the memorial piece is another significant. Um, this is Maji, she was an FTP and she was murdered right before uh, August of 2021. She did not make it out. But we have her in the memorial and we hear time and time again. In fact, I take this portrait to other outings um, because it really is a healing touchstone. She was killed and no one can go back to Afghanistan to truly mourn her, so the memorial has become that place. And this is just um, some examples of the difference um, throughout the past nearly two years of the work that we've done with them, again, to put them front and center, to have them tell their own stories, give them some sense of their own agency back. So in short, um, just a few takeaways. Uh, remain objective, museums are not neutral, uh, but they have to be objective if they want to be credible. Um, and engage ethically, um, especially with people, right, with the sensitivities that are coming out of conflict zones. I mean, similar to your work, you always have to be mindful. Anytime I use any of their images or information, I get a re-release um, and their approval that it's okay to use. And this goes without, should go without saying, be a good listener, use your eyes and ears 50 times more than you use your mouth. Um, and Timothy Schneider, always good. I won't read through those with you, but I do like this last quote, and I think it kind of sums up everything nicely. That museums, uh, why they're a threat to authoritarian regimes is because they're really not just a place of artifacts, but really it's, they're a place of ideas. Okay, that's gonna close it down. We're right on time. Thanks very much for attending, and I hope you have a very pleasant rest of the afternoon.